go ahead and get started because we've got a lot of juicy content to talk about today when it comes to phytoplankton and primary production. Um, and again, feel free to add questions into chat or raise your hand to ask questions. We will have kind of a dedicated Q&A at the tail end here, um, but may pepper in some clarifying questions as we get going. So as always, we want to ground ourselves within the land acknowledgement. While I'm joining today from the traditional lands of the Duwamish, Squamish, and the Stillaguamish, we recognize that water quality touches many of the tribes throughout the region, um, not only in the U.S., but also in Canada, and that continuing to protect that water quality is important in terms of building upon the stewardship that tribes have done since time immemorial, as well as building on, on their knowledge and expertise expertise to bring into these conversations. Um, many of you are familiar faces um, and so are, are very intimately familiar with the workshop series that we have been doing. But for those who are new and perhaps as a reminder early in the morning, um, this workshop series comes out of the Puget Sound Partnerships Marine Water Quality Implementation Strategy. Um, and as with all implementation strategies, that involves collaborating with many of you in the room as experts to talk about what the current state of knowledge is and what some of the technical uncertainties are that as a region we want to address. And so Puget Sound Institute, as part of that, um, is facilitating this scientific workshops um, to dig into some of the technical uncertainties related to nutrients specifically, as well as um, modeling specifically. And so in addition to today, we've got a watershed modeling workshop next week, which for those who also wear many hats, we encourage you to join. It again will be a smaller kind of technical discussion, really getting into the weeds of, of watershed modeling. Um, for today, as with all of our workshops, we do have driving scientific question. Um, that is not to say that this is the only question around the science, but it's one that we're using and kind of come back to as we think about all of this content. And for today, that is considering future climate change, how to changes in density structure in response to the relative timing of coastal upwelling and earlier river discharge alter growth conditions for phytoplankton productivity. And while some of the conversation today will um, definitely focus on modeling, we're looking at this in terms of the, the iterative nature between modeling and monitoring, and particularly when it comes to phytoplankton and primary production, recognize that there, there is a lot of exciting movement on the monitoring front um, that is an important input ultimately to the modeling and, and tools that we have there. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Cheryl um, to talk a little bit about the vital sign work on the monitoring front that's happening in parallel and, and kind of set the stage for us. Thanks, Muriel. This is Cheryl Greengrove. Uh, I'm at University of Washington Tacoma, and today I'm representing the group that's doing the phytoplankton and primary production vital sign development workshops. Uh, and the core team uh, is Jude Apple from Department of Ecology at Padilla Bay, myself, Julia Boss from King County, and the incredible Ashley Bagley from Long Live the Kings that keeps us all together. Um, we also have a team, what we call the PSAT team, Phytoplankton Science Advisory Team, uh, that helps us put these workshops together and gather information, uh, as well as uh, assimilate some of that information together. Uh, so. Um, these are the people in Puget Sound that are working on phytoplankton and primary production. And uh, this, this work is funded by the Puget Sound Partnership and EPA. Um, and we're running a series, next slide please, a series of five workshops. Muriel, are, can I control this? Or, yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Uh, we're running a series of five workshops. And the first thing I want to say is how are these two things related? As Muriel said, the series of workshops that, that Muriel uh, and Stefano and the Puget Sound Institute are running are primarily focused on addressing technical uncertainties and advancing modeling tools, right, to build confidence in the Salish Sea modeling. And so it's, it's very modeling focused and nutrient focused, whereas the phytoplankton workshops are truly focused just on pulling together uh, phytoplankton and primary production data that's been collected through monitoring programs in Puget Sound and to lay a framework for what kind of monitoring do we need 
to move forward with in order to integrate these critical components into the estuarine ecosystem and the Puget Sound and develop in the future, the next round, like next year, the, the a vital sign indicator that'll fit into uh, the Puget Sound partnership vital sign matrix. So that's the relationship between the two sets of workshops. Some people have asked me that and I wanna put that clarifying slide in. Uh, uh, next slide, please. I keep clicking my next slide and of course it doesn't go. Um, it's, it's, it's morning, I need more coffee. So the five workshops, uh, we've run three of them so far. The next one will be in January. The first one was just to pull the phytoplankton community together and see what kind of data we had. Um, and, uh, and that was really terrific. That was a hybrid workshop where a bunch of us were there in person and it was just great to see everyone again. Um, and then the second workshop was to make connections with other vital sign indicator developers, either, either people that had already developed an indicator or were in the process of developing an indicator, like uh, for instance, Julie Keister, who's developing the zooplankton uh, vital sign uh, indicator. And then the workshop that just occurred last month, uh, we brought in some experts, some of them were with us today, um, uh, from the West Coast to talk about um, how they sampled phytoplankton and, and, and determined primary production and how they use that data in their particular estuarine systems, uh, ecosystems to determine the health of that ecosystem. We're going to have another one along that line with experts from around the country and outside the US uh, in January, and it'll probably be late January. We're looking at a date, we almost have it pinned down. Uh, so look for that in your email. And then the final workshop, pulling all this together will be in March. Uh, and then we're, um, we're setting up to write another proposal to Puget Sound Partnership to actually develop. This is just pulling together the framework. Uh, the next step is to actually develop um, uh, the vital sign indicator. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the quick results that we got from that are, um, as I said, getting everybody together was really the first stage, particularly after COVID to share what, what exists in Puget Sound, uh, to find some terms and definitions. Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, rates versus concentrations are very important, particularly for the modelers, uh, as well as us that, that look at the, the real world. Um, and uh, develop a modeling inventory, which is still in progress. We're still filling that in. Uh, as I said, the second workshop was to connect to other vital sign indicator developers that are related to phytoplankton or interested in maybe phytoplankton feeding in or to their to their vital sign indicator, and then the the most recent workshop uh, where we brought in the some experts and shared uh, preliminary uh, review of phytoplankton based indicators and other estuaries. Thank you, Kim Stark, who pulled that together, uh, and a good majority of these use chlorophyll A, um, as well as phytoplankton communities to do that. Um, and some of the things that were highlighted there: the potential to actually combine satellite data with in situ data. And Susan Schramm spoke and talked about uh, the ability to do size fractionation uh, might be helpful for sort of diatom, dianoflagellate distribution kinds of things. And I think I, uh, next slide please, I think I'll stop there. If you wanna know more about these workshops, uh, here are the links to our folders and summary reports from those three workshops. And if you're not already on the mailing list, just uh, contact Ashley Bagley, she'll get you on the mailing list and I hope to see uh, uh, a bunch of you in January. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Marielle. Thank you, Cheryl. And with that, I am very excited to introduce Dr. Sophie Johannesson with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, she is a geochemical oceanographer with research interests ranging from light to underwater weather to burial and reworking of sediments. So kind of looking both at the top and the bottom of all of the system. Um, and with that, Sophie, I will hand it over to you. And then I finally unmuted myself. Hello, Wonderful. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about changing primary productivity in the Sailor Sea. And I mentioned that I'm speaking from a geochemical perspective because I'm not a biologist at all. I don't study phytoplankton or their, their life cycle or taxonomy or anything like that. But there's a surprising amount that you can find out about primary productivity using geochemical tools. And I hope um, I hope this will be useful to you. It doesn't all feed directly into the workshop's main question, but it sort of leads that way towards the end, starting with some contacts. 
So the two, uh, oh, right, I can't move this forward. So um, I'll just, Mary, I'll just say next every now and again, because it's not always a next slide. Sometimes it's an animation, something appearing on the screen. Perfect. Just next. next. Uh, so the two main questions I'm going to talk about are, have total primary productivity changed in the Sailor Sea? And has the type of primary productivity changed? A third question would be, has timing changed? And I think that's an important thing for people to consider, but that's not something I've done any work on yet. Next. So the total primary productivity in the Strait of Georgia has, was quite controversial over time. Back in the 1970s, there was quite an argument in the literature after Tim Parsons had, um, published one number in 1970 of 120 grams carbon per meter squared per year. And then John Stockner, nine years later, uh, went uh, came up with a number almost three times as high, which he ascribed to eutrophication, probably due to sewage. Um, that did cause a bit of an argument. And uh, next. And in... Um, in 1983, Paul Harrison's group was able to reconcile those two numbers. It turned out really patchiness had been the problem that Tim Parsons happened to have been sampling in fairly low productivity areas. And John Stockner, who liked to go fishing while he was collecting his samples, tended to collect his samples from high productivity fronts. So once uh, Harrison had um, a estimated primary productivity in many different areas all around the, the Strait of Georgia and added them together, the number that his group came up with was 280 grams carbon per meter squared per year for total productivity in the Strait of Georgia. Next, and then next again. I'm circling, thank you, I'm circling that, that 1980 just because, that uh, 280, just because I'd like you to remember that number um, because it's going to come back again. So starting with the 280 grams carbon per meter squared per year in the early 80s, the question was, has total primary productivity in the Sailor Sea declined or increased since that time? And this came up for a, a couple of different reasons. From the, the early 2000s to mid 2000s, fisheries models assumed, started with what their basic assumption that the cause of the decline in productivity in the higher trophic levels was because of a decline in carrying capacity related to a decline in productivity at the bottom of the food web. And they calculated that there must have been a 30% decrease in primary production since the 1970s. Then on the other hand, looking at the decline in oxygen in the deep water of the Strait of Georgia, possibly related to eutrophication at the surface that required an increase in primary production of 250% for all that organic matter to sink down, be remineralized, use up the oxygen and cause the observed decline in oxygen. So are we looking for a 30% decrease or a 250% increase? Next. So we took two geochemical approaches, first a nitrogen budget, which was led by Jill Sutton in 2013, and then using some sediment cores. And this is where you'll probably be more interested because it leads into Puget Sound as well as the Strait of Georgia. Um, next. So for the nitrogen budget, we, we we determined um, particulate and dissolved nitrogen budgets. We had a lot of data to use for this project, um, an unusual amount for an observational program. We had um, seawater concentrations and river water concentrations. We had suspended particles, sinking particles and sediment traps, we had sediment cores, atmospheric deposition and various municipal um, inputs as well. And we were able to come up with a fairly tightly constrained uh, nitrogen budget. The point of this project wasn't actually to calculate what the rate of primary productivity was. It was just to find out what the major levers were in nitrogen in the Strait of Georgia. But we did come up with a fairly tight estimate in the end. The main thing to take away from this image, which is just a, a plot of the dissolved inorganic nitrogen budget, is look at all those little arrows at the top. Those are all the inputs from land, and um, including the, the largest number, the from which is from rivers, the 1700 there, all of those things are completely dwarfed by the export and import for, from the open ocean on the left, those very large pale blue arrows. That's where most of the nitrogen cycle is controlled by the import from the open ocean and export again in the surface water. And also look at the big circle in the middle, pretty well all of that imported new nitrogen gets incorporated into phytoplankton and then remineralized again. Only a little bit is exported into the sediments. Next. 
So the result of that nitrogen budget was that came up with exactly the same number as Harrison had in 1983. I mean, the fact that it's to three significant figures, the same number is just coincidental, I'm sure. But the but we were able to constrain it tightly enough, as you see, 280 plus or minus 20, that we can say, next, that we can say with some confidence that productivity has not increased by 250% or de decreased by 30% since the 1970s. Next. But what about Puget Sound and what about the longer term? Next. So there we went and looked at sediments. There was a paper that, that was um, published by Jill Brandenberger in 2011 about based on four sediment cores in Puget Sound, which implied that there had been a decline in productivity over time. That's, Jill didn't conclude that absolutely that was what happened, but her results were consistent with the decline in productivity over time in Puget Sound. And so we wondered whether we could see the same thing in the Strait of Georgia cores. And then um, Jill was very, was enthusiastic about the project, and but she had unfortunately become, uh, she'd taken a management job on the East Coast by this time. So she passed this over to her colleague, Jonathan Strivens. Um, and we worked together with sediment cores from all over Puget Sound, Strait of Georgia. Can you, uh, next please. So these are the locations of the cores in Strait of Georgia and the, um, the four Puget Sound cores. I don't know, I guess that's probably, that ribbon's probably not in your way. Um, yeah, so Puget Sound, we have the four cores that uh, Jill had collected in 2005. And by the way, keep in mind, those cores were collected in 2005. So we're not talking about the last 15 years of trends. We're talking about up to 2005 in those cores. Um, some of the Strait of Georgia ones are from about 2008, and, some, and then some of them are more recent up to about 2020. Next. So our method was to use stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. So looking at them separately, they can tell you different things about the source of organic matter. So del C13, for example, can tell you whether you're looking at a more marine or a more terrigenous source, with the terrigenous material having a lighter signature and the marine being heavier. It also can tell you about what the rate of productivity, where you've got really high productivity, the phytoplankton would prefer to take carbon-12, and so they use that up preferentially, leaving behind the carbon-13, so that over the course of a bloom, the sinking material becomes heavier and heavier in carbon isotope space. And DELA in 15 also tells about whether it's marine to a terrigenous source with the, again, the heavier um, DELA in 15 being related to marine end and lighter to terrigenous. But it, it also tells you about the length of the food chain because it turns out that uh, with each step of the food chain, there is quite a large increase in the nitrogen isotope uh, signature. Next, because each one of them can tell different, two different things, uh, it's difficult to interpret these isotopes individually, but we can interpret them together. Next. So here is a plot of del C13, the carbon stable isotope ratio on the y-axis and del N15 on the x-axis there. And these, the triangle with the, the three squares there outlines um, a set of data on let me try it again. The, the squares each represent end members that are from terrigenous to marine and two different types of marine sinking organic matter. And the dots don't fill this triangle because this triangle was based on a different set of data um, collected in the, the late 1990s. And so we were able to define a terrigenous end member based on outflow from the Fraser River and two different kinds of marine end member based on a much larger set of sinking particle data from sediment traps. The marine bloom and marine non-bloom end members are um, based on these, these stable isotope ratios again, so that what we're calling a bloom end member has relatively lower del N15, because that's a time when you have a shorter food chain, larger phytoplankton-like diatoms, larger copepods, so a short food chain. Um, but because it's highly productive, you've got a heavier C13 because the phytoplankton are using up the light isotope. And then the marine non-bloom is the opposite. It's, it represents a longer food chain, smaller phytoplankton, or more recycling in the water column. So these dots in the middle of this triangle now were, are from all those sediment cores that I showed in the earlier slide. The yellow dots are from Strait of Georgia and the black ones are from Puget Sound. And I'm going to 
I, I just remember for a second, because I'm not, probably not going to show this slide again, just remember right now that the yellow dots tend to be, for the Strait of Georgia, tend to be more towards the bloom side and the black ones more to, uh, span both the bloom and the non-bloom side. But that's not what I'm going to talk about first, just remember that. So what we did first to figure out whether there had been a change in the total productivity over time was we added together the proportions of marine bloom and marine non-bloom material to make just one single marine derived end member. And then we plotted that over time in the sediment cores from Strait of Georgia and Puget Sound to see whether there had been a change in the flux of the marine type organic matter from phytoplankton over time. Next. Then skipping over many details and lots of other slides I could show, in the interest of time, jump to the end here. And the, the answer based on that uh, marine end member is that the flux of marine derived organic carbon has not increased or declined over the last, not just since the 1970s, but over the last 100 years in Strait of Georgia or Puget Sound. Uh, yes, that's a question about the Fraser River end member. That's a good point, and I will answer that later. Um, yeah, so in these cores, there's this core on the left, the GVRD one, that's from Strait of Georgia, and the PS1, that's an example from Puget Sound. I could have shown any of them, but these were two that I picked out. Um, and you can see there's definitely no, so the time is going upwards, because this is a sediment core, and sediment is accumulating over time. So you can see there's no decline towards the surface. There might be an increase, and above where I've drawn the lines, there's definitely an increase toward the surface. But it turned out on further analysis that that's actually not an increase in flux. It was just burned down in the sediments. So when you're past the depth where the bacteria and they're acting really fast, and you're past the depth where the big bugs are stirring things around and eating the organic matter, once you're below there, and you're just looking at long-term trends, there's been no change over the last 100 years. So that was the answer to that first question. Next. Oh, and one more. So this is where we get into the second question. Has the type of productivity in the Sailor Sea changed? This came out of the long-term observation program by Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, and I know that some of your organizations are not getting along very well right now with the Washington State Department of Ecology, but fortunately mine is. And so I have some slides um, that, that uh, Christopher Krems has shown before to talk about what they have discovered in their work. So they've had, got this amazing monitoring program where they've got 37 stations as shown in the little map there in Puget Sound that they've been monitoring monthly since 1973. Um, and next. And they have, and Christopher has begun to think, looking at the nutrient data over time, that there has been a major change uh, in the type of productivity in the sound, or that there could have been. So this goes back to the basic question underlying this workshop. Um, Christopher was looking at uh, first at just nutrient nutrients in surface waters, the top 30 meters. And so this is this plot actually is a couple of years old. This is first nitrate anomalies and then silicate to nitrate ratio anomalies. Um, because there is a lot of variability in the absolute concentrations in different areas of Puget Sound, um, Christopher hasn't plotted here the total concentrations. He has at each site, he has <clears throat> determined and removed the average and he's put an anomaly for each site for each year and then averaged those together. So he ends up with one value for Puget Sound for each year. That's an anomaly. And it appeared that for 10 years there from 1998 to 2008, that the nitrate anomaly was increasing rapidly. Next. But then that trend turned around, went back down again. Maybe it's gone back up again, though there's not, uh, you know, there's only one point there so far to show it was going back up. Meanwhile, the silicate to nitrate ratio had declined. So this was consistent with the idea that possibly as a result of climate change or local human activities, that the um, there was a change in these uh, surface concentrations and ratios of nutrients, which might be supporting a change from diatoms to smaller phytoplankton or to more rapid recycling within the water column and more a bacterial dominated food chain. Next. And it, it is clear that the climate drivers have changed. So on the left-hand side of this slide is a plot showing them what the models would expect, showing that we're expecting a change from snow-dominated flow to rain-dominated flow. And on the right-hand side, there are some modeling data. The, um, these are, again, in anomaly space, not absolute values. 
The red dashed line on the right hand side represents the temperature anomaly. And what it's showing is that over these 20 years, the um, water is now cool, the water in the rivers and streams is now cooler in January to April, but hotter through the summer and, um, and autumn. And meanwhile, the stream flow has changed in the opposite direction with more stream flow, in, a little bit more in the winter, a lot more in the fall and less in the summer. Next. And this has uh, led to a change, an increase in stratification in Puget Sound. Um, that the stratification value was determined based on uh, density calculated from the temperature and salinity measurements that they make during their regular monitoring program. So there's definitely been an increase and these and these anomalies, this is again an anomaly space over the whole Puget Sound, one dot per, uh, oh, more than one per year, no, one dot per year. So we're, we're seeing an increased stratification, uh, particularly in the late winter. Next. And it seems that this change in flow is uh, correlated with changes in chlorophyll, again, over the top 30 meters. So where in the winter time, there's more stream flow and there seems to be slightly higher chlorophyll, but in the summer with the lower stream flow, there is uh, lower chlorophyll. So there does seem to be a, a change in the phytoplankton biomass that's correlated with these climate drivers. Um, next. But Puget Sound is not the same as Strait of Georgia, and different areas in Puget Sound may be responding differently. Next. This plot compares Puget Sound with the Strait of Georgia, the northern half of the Strait of Georgia. I broke Strait of Georgia into two halves because they tend to act rather differently from one another. Um, Puget Sound on the top there, the top two plots, nitrate and the silicate to nitrate ratio, those are the anomalies I showed before. And on the lower half, this is Strait of Georgia. These are not anomalies. These are absolute concentrations. Um, but you can you can see from the shape of those that uh, you absolutely don't see the same trends that you're seeing in Puget Sound. Now, uh, Christopher very kindly last week took all my data and he did the same calculation he does for Puget Sound and he came up with an annual anomaly for the whole straight point per year. And as he put it, you would need three glasses of wine to see a trend in those data there. We just don't see the same thing, the same change happening in Strait of Georgia as Puget Sound. Next. This makes the same point again, but the southern Strait of Georgia, the plots are a little bit different. Um, but the uh, but again, you see that it's different from Puget Sound. Next. So this one's going to take some explanation. So then um, there are different regions of Puget Sound may be changing differently. So those last slides were all about water column data of um, dissolved nutrients. Now I'm going back into the sediments again at the bottom. And this one is, so some people will have seen the first part of the talk some before, some will have seen the second. This is hot off the presses, I just made it up this week. And there's going to be a fair bit of hand waving, may turn out to be wrong, but I just want to show you because it was surprisingly interesting. So remember I said in that plot of the end members of nitrogen and carbon stable isotopes, that the Strait of Georgia tended to fall towards the bloomy side and Puget Sound was in the bloomy and non-bloomy part. I never noticed that until this week. And then I, when I did, I thought, I wonder whether that, the, because I'd put all the Puget Sound sediment core data in there together, I wondered whether maybe it was a change over time from the bloomy to the non-bloomy within Puget Sound. And that would be consistent with this change from larger phytoplankton like diatoms in a short food chain to the rapid, more rapid recycling and smaller uh, phytoplankton and the, this hypothesis that we're investigating for Puget Sound. So if you see a change from bloom to non-bloom in the flux of organic matter into the sediments, that could reflect a change from this short food chain with the large phytoplankton to the, to the smaller phytoplankton in the surface waters. So this this is one core, I'm showing it two different ways. So remember before when I was looking at the total productivity over time, I had summed the two marine end members. This time I've separated them out and I've plotted the bloom marine end member flux and the non-bloom marine end member flux, both from the sediment core that was collected at the south end of the main basin of Puget Sound. And I'll need to orient you a little bit to this, these core data. So this is depth in core down the left-hand side. The small dotted line there with SML above it, that represents the surface mixed layer. That's where the biggest animals will be living and stirring around the sediment. And in this particular core, it's about 20 centimeters deep. There's a, there's a lot of stirring going on. 
Um, and there's bacterial degradation of organic carbon below that, but the but the main uh, changes happen um, where you've got oxygen going into the sediments because these big animals. And then down lower down, I've written about 100 years before collection. I um, because of all the stirring in the surface mix layer, it's not possible to say this depth in the core represents this date because it's all smeared together with sediment that was let that landed before and sediment that landed after. I could model this carefully and figure out where the earliest and the latest depths of 100 years could end up, but I didn't do that for this. What I did was I just used the sedimentation rate, and that dashed line represents where 100 years would be, and then I added on the approximately the depth of the surface mix layer above and below it, just to show that 100 years is not one depth, it's a whole range. But then if you look above the top of that blue band of of 100 years, and you look towards going up towards the surface, it appears that at this south end of Puget Sound, the bloom type organic matter was increasing since uh, from over the last 100 years, and the non bloom type was decreasing. So that's opposite to the hypothesis that we're looking for. But if you look at the sediment core as a whole, you can see that earlier, the, the values were very similar to at the bottom of the record, the values are very similar to what they're at the top. And it seems that there was some change over the last um, you know, 150 years or so um, that went in opposite directions in bloom, non-bloom and back. Um, I'll think about that in a second, Parker. I'm not certain whether I can directly relate that, but I'll try. Um, and going back towards the original values. But that's in, in the main basin of Puget Sound. Next. And the same plotted in a core from Hood Canal. This time the 100 years is shallower because the sedimentation rate is slower and the surface mix there also happens to be smaller. It's only 10 centimeters here, not 20. But if you look above that 100 year line, you can see pretty much the opposite to what we saw in the main basin where it appears that the bloom type material over the last 100 years has declined and maybe stabilized. And the non-bloom has increased. It's It could be in that and that uh, bloom one that we're seeing a turnaround. But if you just look over the whole time series all the way down to the bottom of the core, you see there's been a fair bit of variability in this bloom type flex, but the non-bloom just seems to be increasing, increasing over time. So I don't know whether that for sure indicates that there has been a change in Hood Canal from the larger phytoplankton to the smaller, but it would be consistent. That, that was what we would expect to see if that were the case. As I said, new data, hand wavy, but that's what I'm that's what I've just discovered doing this. Next. So in conclusion, what we know so far, the total primary productivity is unchanged since the 1970s and over the last 100 years. I think I'm confident in that. The type of productivity might have changed from diatom dominated to small phytoplankton dominated, but if so, not everywhere. It, the, the changes are not the same as Strait of Georgia as Puget Sound, and they don't appear to be the same in Hood Canal as in Main Basin based on sediments, at least. And I, I um, don't know the answer to whether that's the same in, in nutrient space or not. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention in the nutrient data is that um, when Christopher made those anomaly plots for me, although there were no long-term trends, what was very clear was that the anomalies were somewhat coherent from year to year. The, the variability was coherent over a number of years. So it wasn't just a random change in anomaly from one year to the next year to the next year to the next year. It was that there would be an increase over a few years and then a decrease over a few years. So there is some kind of multi-annual control on these water properties that we're looking at that we definitely need to investigate. I, I don't know what is controlling that exactly, but I mean, we do have longer term changes in, uh, you know, cycles in climate effects. So it could be that those large scale drivers just drive Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia over multi-year timescales. And we have yet to link those changes to climate stressors. Next. And then um, Mariel asked me to include any proposals for future work on this kind of topic. So I have one idea with my Sierra Costa is to combine satellite and sediment trap data in the Strait of Georgia. Um, my Sierra has a way of looking at satellite ocean color and, and um, determining what type of phytoplankton we're looking at, not down to species level, but I think sort of in a general way. And then I'd like to know whether what we can see at the surface in terms of productivity and perhaps type of plankton, how does that relate to what's actually exported to the sediment traps 50 meters below, so outside the eutrophic zone. And then separately with Akash Sastri, who is a zooplankton um, uh, biologist at the Institute of Ocean Sciences where I work, and Christopher Krems, to combine the nutrient data, the sediment core geochemistry, and water column taxonomy to see whether the type of productivity has changed over time in the Salish Sea, and if so, does it relate to climate stressors? 
And I think that it would be really helpful to collect some new chords in Puget Sound, since those ones were the, that I've been showing today were collected in 2005. We don't know what's happened since then. And it might be useful to um, deploy some sediment traps too. And a quick answer to the ammonia question. No, I didn't look at that. That would be interesting. Okay. Um, I think next, I think that's all I have to say. Here we go. So yes. there's my Thank email you. address. There's my email address. And if you have questions about uh, Christopher Krems' data, I suggest you contact him directly. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sophie. I see lots of questions coming into the chat. Um, we're going to hold those in the interest of time, and that also gives you some time to noodle on them, Sophie. Um, with that, I'm going to hand things over to my Sira. Um, so my Sira Costa is with the University of Victoria. Um, she leads the Spectral Remote Sensing Lab there, and her research as well as the lab are working towards developing research methods to make more effective use of remotely sensed imagery for understanding and monitoring biophysical processes in ocean waters and wetlands, and also researching light attenuation in coastal and river um, riverine waters. So with that, my Sira, I'll hand it over to you and, and feel free to add in any context I missed in that. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, so that was a full introduction. So I don't know if I have more to say, maybe just to highlight that uh, we do a lot of work uh, with kelp, even including some collaboration with the vital sign that it's looking at kelp vital signs in Puget Sound as well. So which is a big part of my research program right now. Um, so yeah, thank you for inviting me. And uh, uh, also, I would like to to acknowledge um, uh, the, the 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 group that is here in this meeting today. And we'll be talking about remote sensing technology to monitor ocean condition. It's mostly based on the work that I've been doing in uh, the Strait of Georgia and the North Pacific, and some of the tools that we're developing to look at large scale changes in ocean conditions and uh, uh, what we call the bioregionalization of these areas to facilitate the understanding of the dynamic and change with time. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Lokongis people whose traditional territory, UVIC, stands. And I'll do the same as Sophie. I'll say just next. If it's okay. Yeah, so the first thing that I would like to show to you is this quite beautiful image, which includes the um, Strait of uh, uh, the Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia and Salish Sea as a whole. And uh, this is a product from Sentinel-3 that we generate on a daily basis. This is from September 2nd, 2022, where you see the different colors. It's already a product, so it's not in reflectance anymore. This is a chlorophyll product. And the legend, the color bars are on the side there. And this is part of an application that we developed as part of a few projects called the Algae Explore. Uh, which is operation for visualization of daily product for the entire coast of British Columbia and does include part of Puget Sound as well, as you can see there. This program now, uh, the Algae Explore, uh, runs in the Azure cloud system and our Hakai Institute is taking over it and upgrading it to a better product so people can actually download data as part of the Canadian integrating uh, ocean observing system. So we're going to be, um, this, this entire infrastructure is going to be passed to the CEO's uh, Canadian system. So next, please. And for some of you who are not very familiar with this line of satellites, I'll just talk briefly about the Sentinel-3A and 3B, which were ocean color, in part ocean color, but they also have payloads for other kind of data. Uh, they have a saltimeter and they have a sea surface temperature payload and they have the ocean color payload, which is mostly what I'm gonna be talking about today. This is part of the Copernicus uh, series of, uh, of satellites, including sentinel 3A and 3B. Sentinel 3A was launched in, uh, in, in 2016 and its operation now. And, uh, and Sentinel 3B also was launched in 2019. Next one. And I think for, for most of us, a very exciting part is the, the upcoming 
space mission, the, the Planck Aerosol Cloud Ocean System, which is a NASA mission. So Sentinel-3 is a multispectral uh, satellite, uh, a few bands, broad bands, but very dedicated for ocean observation uh, at 300 meter spatial resolution. PACE come with a full hyperspectral uh, payload, which means it will be able to solve many more features in the ocean in terms of biogeochemical parameters based on the very narrow bands now that is acquired, which we call this in hyperspectral mode. However, PACE is in a one kilometer spatial resolution. Next, please. Uh, so our work in BC started with very ground understanding of what kind of data we have, what it's the quality of this data, of the satellite data. And it started a few years ago. And the first thing for us, which is very important in, in using those kind of products uh, acquired by satellites, is defining the radiometry, the quality of the radiometry of the satellite, the quality of the data that the satellite is acquiring. So to do that, we install these sensors aboard of the BC ferry two ferries going from Vancouver Island to, to Vancouver to Tuasen. And those are autonomous sensors. You see there the little white kind of robot looking. And those are sensors looking at irradiance coming from the sky, irradiance come from the sky, and radiance coming from the water. And together, you can produce reflectance. These sensors are, uh, um, they, they autonomous move themselves to find the best position relationship to the sun according to the position of the ship itself. So it was a big, big increase in in situ data for us to be able to say, okay, Sentinel-3A and 3B are doing well. And this data was also used to provide um, uh, information for vicarious calibrations by the European Space Agency for these specific satellites. We use this data, it's show the data is good now. We adapt some atmosphere correction of the, the, the signal acquired by the satellite now in reflectance, and we validate those atmosphere correction, use data from the sensors. And then after everything is, is agreed that it's good, we start to work on the model development or model adaptations for our waters. So we generate what we call the chlorophyll products, the turbidity prod products, and dissolved organic matter products based on reflectance data from Sentinel-3A and Sentinel-3B. We also develop a model to look at phytoplankton groups, which we call the PFT, phytoplankton functional types. It's kind of a jargon. Uh, and then with that, we also work on bioregionalization of this water that we're working with. Next, please. Uh, so these are one of the products. This is validated. All this data is published. So this is from Sentinel-3. These are uh, just for example, these are climatology for the spring, summer, and fall for the entire coast of British Columbia, south of Alaska, and uh, including Puget Sound as well, as you can see there. Next one, please. And this is for dissolved organic matter. So the same reflectance data go through another model and produce the dissolved organic matter product. Next one, please. And uh, the third one is the turbidity one in milligrams per liter. Um, easily seen that when you have the very red ones, which are higher concentrations of total suspended matter in the water, these areas are close to the main rivers uh, outflows uh, along our coast. Next one, please. So the other thing, so you have this product that we generate and uh, the other thing that we generate that we developed the, the model recent is the phytoplankton groups. I'm not gonna go through too much detail on the model itself, but just briefly explaining. We look at the uh, HPLC pigments and this is ingested into a Chemtex library to define phytoplankton groups. And uh, we associate those phytoplankton groups with the reflectance measure by Sentinel-3. And then from that, we derived a uh, empirical orthogonal function approach that attaches or better describes each of the phytoplankton group that are our interest. And obviously, because our data is not comprehensive, the in situ data for the Chemtax library is not fully comprehensive, this model works 
quite well for some of the phytoplankton groups and not others because we not we don't have this exhaustive database right now. Hopefully, we'll update that in the future. And after this model is applied, uh, is developed, we bring it to the spatial domain. That's what you see on the right side box. So it's the application of the empirical orthogonal function model on the Sentinel reflectance uh, pixel based imagery. Next one, please. And then we have those uh, phytoplankton groups maps. And I'm showing to you there just a few of the group that works better for the data set uh, that we built the empirical orthogonal function model. So diatoms in the spring, some and fall, each row has a season. Uh, it's not a climatology, it's a specific day as an example. Uh, you have cryptophytes and you have green algae and raphidophytes. In this specific year in 2018, we had some uh, raphidophytes bloom, uh, especially in the spring and summertime in this region. And that was uh, well captured actually by the by the satellite with this this model that we developed, and uh, this data was validated based on in situ sample, um, and also was validated based on independent in situ sample that were collected by the Hakai Institute, and that's what I showed there on the right side. The first row uh, in plots is the is about the diatoms and the the blue. Um, um, the blue signs are the Sentinel-3 derived diatoms concentration, and the red ones are the one measured by Hakai as an example. And it does follow very similar pattern. Uh, for the other groups, you still see it following the pattern, not as well. Uh, and a reason for that is the fact that the diatom is the, mo is the best represented in our database. So therefore, the tuning of the EOF model is the best for the diatom itself. So we feel that as we increase the representation of the other phytoplankton groups in our database, uh, we will be able to retrieve these phytoplankton groups even better. But keep in mind that now you can have this data as, approx as an approximation for the spatial distribution in time of those different phytoplankton groups. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, previous one, sorry. Uh, and the very exciting thing as well is what PACE will be able to do, This the new NASA satellite that hopefully will be launched in 2024, which is hyperspectral. And to prepare for that, because we have this hyperspectral data acquired aboard the ferry by the little guy that I mentioned to you in the, one of the first slides, which shows there on the top right side, uh, it's the same type of hyperspectral data that PACE will be able to acquire. And then what we see here is that you know, from from the ferry run, that's why we only have a line there, so we don't have for the entire Salish Sea, it's just along the run of the ferry, we have a very detailed spatial distribution of phytoplankton groups, in the case diatom, cryptophyte, green algae, and raphidophytes for the same, for same years on the previous one. So we expect that uh, PACE will be doing this continuously for this entire region. And the really cool thing is that with hyperspectral data, the accuracy of the retrievals increase for all the group that we're looking at. And that's because you have more freedom with hyperspectral data to characterize spectrally each individual group. With Sentinel, you have a few bands. Now you're going to have hundreds of bands to characterize. So it'll be a plus. However, it's a one kilometer spatial resolution. So meaning that some of the areas, specifically in Puget Sound, maybe will be compromised by the spatial resolution on pace but we may have some generic information about the Salish Sea as a whole. Next one, please. Uh, so now I'm gonna jump in. So we have all these products that I mentioned to you. We have the chlorophyll, turbidity, sea dom, phytoplankton functional types, not for all the groups. Some work well and work mostly with the ones that work well. But then we, we start to look at, okay, you can't look at this entire region in a pixel base. We have to define these cohesive areas, which we call bioregions, to understand how they change in time, right? Because if you start to do analysis in a pixel base, it's too much information at the end of the day. Very important for a small region. But if you want to look at large regions, such as the entire uh, coast of British Columbia, then it becomes a little bit more complicated. So we adopted this neural network approach called self-organized mapping, which we ingested all the chlorophyll 
retail products generated by Sentinel for this region. So about 8,000 image from 2016 to about 2021 when we're working on this project. And we ingested all this data in. And what uh, the SOM, the self-organized mapping does is looking at space and time and define what we call the bioregions considered in space and time independent of our input. So, and that gives to us this map on the right side there. So these are what we consider the bioregions of this coastal and slightly offshores water as well. And what we can do with this now, it's what's in the next slide, please. We start to look at phytoplankton phenology. I'm not going to go into the details. This is all published, so I can send the papers to whoever is more interested. Uh, but we can see in the top plots there is the phenology of phytoplankton within the climatology. Now we're looking at this on a yearly basis. So within the climatology of all the data that was used, how does bioregion one behave in regard to bioregion two in terms of chlorophyll change, we, we call it the phenology, uh, along the year? Right, so this is a climatology, it's weekly based data enter for this specific climatology from 2016 to 2021. And you can look at uh, what is the, uh, the blue plot, the blue map there, which is phytoplankton blue initiation in this region. And you can go to the right side there on the plot and see, okay, how the different bioregions behaving in regards to blue initiation within the climatology. And then the beauty now is going to what we, we're doing right now is looking at within each bioregion on a yearly basis, what is changing and what is the importance of those changes. Next one. Uh, we're doing the same approach uh, for uh, looking at a longer time series. So Sentinel-3, as I mentioned to you, was launched in 2016, which makes our time series count kind of constraints in terms of number of years. So we started to use, so we validate first, but we start to use what's called the merged ocean color product. So this is all this ocean color satellites were put together by two groups in, in Europe. Uh, and they produce two different products. One is called Globe Color, and the other one is called Ocean Color CCI. So this data is using, as I said, all the satellite ocean color uh, uh, available from 1997 to present. That includes Sea Weaves, Marys, Modis, Aqua, Sentinel, Veers. So everything that was once fly and it's still flying. And then we put together an uh, in situ database from uh, many organizations that was available, especially DFO. And we did a comparison of these products and found that the Globe Color interpolated product is excellent for this region. It retrieves chlorophyll very well. So we can have a time series now from 1997 to the present with the only uh, downside. It's always available in four kilometers. So we again lose a lot of information. But we're doing this and what the map shows on the bottom there are you know, this entire time series, about 25 years climatology for the spring, summer, and fall for this entire region, and also includes the, the Puget Sound, as you can see in the maps there. Next one, please. And we're doing similar work for the entire North Pacific. We look at this entire climatology from the globe color data, and we are de deriving chlorophyll phenology and, and the phytoplankton functional types for each of those bioregions using the same self-organizing approach. So instead of just looking at the coast, now we're going to look at the entire North Pacific and see how this habitat that salmon use is changed in space and time. And our analysis is going to be based on bioregions, right? And that's what it shows on the right side there is the phenology of chlorophyll in the bioregions. So we have this for the phytoplankton groups as well. Next one, please. So, and how this all converge um, um, from satellite observation, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and possible implications for salmon? That's the big question. Not always easy to put together. 
especially because of lack of data most of the time, right? And sometimes, uh, just between us here, the will of sharing information between different research groups, which is fair, right? So I'm not saying the negative way, but th this happens as well. So here's an example of uh, a, a trial that we did to show the link between the satellite data, how this could be used if to look at zooplankton distribution, looking at the match and my mismatch hypothesis between those two and with implications for, uh, for, for, for salmon in the Strait of Georgia. So that's, this is a work that uh, um, Karen Such published this year. And in a very brief way, what I'm showing here on the left side plots is the, the first bar, the first plot is abundance of zooplankton. The second plot is biomass of zooplankton for a time series and available from DFO. And for each of those groups, what I have is in red, it's average phytoplankton bloom initiation time, early phytoplankton bloom initiation time, and late phytoplankton bloom initiation time in the Strait of Georgia. So this doesn't include Puget Sound. And what, uh, what we note is when you have early phytoplankton bloom, maybe we're looking at a mismatch. So when the phytoplankton bloom will start to happen at the end of February, very beginning of March, we end up seeing a high abundance of small zooplankton in the Strait of Georgia. So there is high abundance, but they are low biomass. And this can have implications because perhaps the quality of the food is not as high. And this can lead to poor condition for juvenile salmon in the Strait of Georgia. And perhaps when you have average blooms, you have uh, the best conditions. Uh, so there will be a match between zooplankton and phytoplankton producing high quality food for salmon in the region. Uh, next, please. So, uh, and just to finalize the entire story, I don't have a summary organized like Sophie had, but uh, maybe a few words is that uh, there is many challenges of using satellite data. Uh, uh, one of them is you really have to trust the data that you're using or to have to understand how much you can trust the data that you're using. So validation of these products are the most are of the most important. Uh, I never use data for push and sound to validate any of the product that we're generating. We produce data that corresponds to Puget Sound as well, with assumption that behaves similar to the, the waters of the Strait of Georgia, which perhaps is not a bad assumption, but we never did this validation uh, in, a, in, a, in a precise way. So I think that's an important message. So any use of these data farther into the Puget Sound should, should consider a, a validation step to make sure that the product that we're generating are good enough or if they need some adaptation for these waters, right? So, but that's happened with any kind of data, right? That you're collecting, you really need to trust your data. So there are opportunities to improve all this data set and stop looking at the boundaries, right? Um, uh, so this is just one part in situ information and modeling are very important in this entire framework. And the satellite data can be very useful for this large scale understanding of what's happening in the region and even feeding uh, the models, the biogeochemical models for the region, because it, it does give to you what can be considered in situ information in a large spatial and temporal scale. So what you see in the bottom there is a climato climatology from Sentinel-3A for uh, August, the month of August 2022 and the month of October of 2022. I mean, I always say, are there arrows on that? Likely, but you know what? There's a lot of good information there that can be used to understand what's happening in the system in the scale that the data can offer to you, which is kind of this large temporal and spatial scale. And with that, I'll say thank you. And if you have any questions, I can respond an hour, I guess, later. I'll let uh, the organizer decide that. Yes, thank you, my Sierra, very much. And thank you for your patience as I have apparently some auto timings in there. So I uh, appreciate you rolling with things, jumping around. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in, which I think we can hold for now, um, but again, gives you an opportunity to kind of chew on them in the meantime. And then we're going to 
switch gears really briefly, and I'm going to invite Jan Newton, Executive Director of Nanos, who many of you know, um, to share an, an opportunity that builds on and complements a lot of this work as well. Thank you, Marielle, and it's a pleasure to be here, and hello to all of you. Um, it's been wonderful listening um, to our Canadian colleagues, really rich data sets. So I think as scientists, we can all um, think about the data that you have that you never got to fully analyze. Um, and so what I am presenting here is an opportunity to look at actual primary productivity data. So this is carbon-14 uptake um, to measure primary production um, that has been measured by myself um, through a variety of programs over the years. So some of these were um, in response to like um, the Lacey Olympia, Thurston, Tumwater, um, sewage outfall lot, or the King County outfall, um, or programs like the Hood Canal Dissolved Oxygen Program. So um, there's numerous um, uh, programs, and you see some of them listed, PRISM, SPASM, et cetera, um, where we measured primary production, as well as calculating um, something called the P to B ratio, the projection to biomass, where you're using the carbon-14 estimate of production and then chlorophyll um, for the biomass and looking at how that ratio um, varies. Uh, the other thing is that in a lot of these studies, because it was um, for wastewater treatment plants, we also added nutrients. And so we have the ability to um, measure how sensitive the primary production was to that nutrient addition. Um, so as Cheryl has described in Puget Sound, there's been a coming together of um, a lot of biological oceanographers to look at the, um, what do we have in terms of data? And when we look at that on a regional basis, so much of that is chlorophyll um, and, and less of it is actual primary productivity. And so um, as we all know, it's, it's more complicated to measure that and using radioisotopes and 24 hour incubations and all of that sort of thing isn't something that most monitoring programs are set up to do. So I'm sitting on top of a lot of historical data that I think could be incredibly useful um, to look at regional patterns. And I summarized some of this um, for PRISM, but I, I'm away from my main computer and so I couldn't even find the map. So um, there's, a, there's a cool representation that shows some interesting regional patterns. But with this, we can also um, look at comparability to chlorophyll or phytoplankton counts. And as I mentioned, I'm teaching a class up here in Friday Harbor. And uh, my students every year look at both phytoplankton enumeration and chlorophyll. And there typically isn't that great of a relationship. But with this very large data set, we could start to assess some of that. Also, um, the purpose of this meeting, um, provide input for model parameterization. So um, the organizers asked me to um, tell you about this data set. And um, I think it would be fantastic to support a student to, to work with me to get some of this um, compiled, analyzed, synthesized, and ultimately published. So that's, that's my spiel. And I'll turn it back over to Marielle and um, for any other follow-up for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, and please feel free to the region to drop either clarifying questions, ideas around this in terms of additional analysis you'd like to see, or, or thoughts on resources in terms of, of getting a student there. Um, with that, we're going to switch things over to Dr. Brian Hunt. Um, he is with the University of British Columbia and is an ecosystem oceana oceanographer. Wow, words this morning. Maybe I need some more coffee. Um, and is going to share some insights from his research as really just a, a teaser um, in terms of some of the bottom-up drivers of zooplankton food web structure and function. Brian, I'll hand it over to you. Brian, 
Brian, are you able to unmute? Let me make sure you have the magic power. Ha. You should now be able to unmute. Uh -huh. There we go. And I can video as well. Cool. Yes. Um, okay. Um, morning, everyone. I hope my internet's okay. I'm in a remote uh, field spot. Um, is that is that coming out okay? Yeah, you're coming through clear. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, and so I'm uh, I'm tuning in from the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Slaywatooth Nation up at the top of Indian Arm, and I'm looking out across uh, the water at uh, father seals feeding on anchovy or herring. There's quite a lot of activity right now, so excuse me if I get distracted. Um, so yeah, thanks for the intro. I'll be making trying to yeah just show you give me a little bit of a, a, a some flavor of connection, the connections between phytoplankton and zooplankton. So the kinds of things <laughs> that, uh, thanks Ben, um, the kinds of things that we think about um, in, the, in, in the food web um, that are important for um, impacts on upper trophic levels. So um, but yeah, this work is, um, it's results of collaborations of a, of a large group of people. I'll be showing you um, citations for some of the, just the few figures that I show. Um, There'll be one name there, the first author, but lots of people have contributed to this. So definitely it's all collaborative, uh, very much collaborative work. Um, I can't, oh, next please. Yes, I, <laughs> I get it. Okay, so um, for this slide, what I just, yeah, so again, I, just to reiterate, so what I'm focusing on is the, the parts of the phytoplankton that we think are particularly relevant to zooplankton. So just want to walk you through these figures on the right-hand side. Um, the one at the top, um, the if you look at the green, that's total chlorophyll. So I'll just uh, yeah clarify. This is from a station in the northern strait of Georgia. Um, it's a monitoring station of the Hakka Institute. Um, so sort of deep uh, central uh, part of the northern strait of Georgia, and um, it's data from twenty uh, January twenty fifteen to uh, November twenty eighteen. And so we are, you're seeing the seasonal climatologies here. So the total chlorophyll in the top figure is in dark green. And you can see there's a um, typical sort of spring bloom, bloom and then a fall bloom. Um, we have hoofers, the highly unsaturated fatty acids, uh, DHA and EPA. And you can see that they actually, they don't track the phytoplankton biomass. They have a pretty consistent sort of high level between March and, uh, and sort of October. And then total fatty acids um, uh, in the pale gray, which is which shows the, the bimodal peaks a little bit like the phytoplankton biomass, but it's, it's actually pretty high throughout the, the spring to fall period. The middle plot is showing the phytoplankton size classes. So we really care about phytoplankton size class because so much of zooplankton feeding and any marine life feeding is size structured. And so the important things here are the microphytoplankton in dark green that show that um, that peak in the spring, so like what we all know, the styotin um, dominated spring bloom. And then um, the nanophytoplankton, uh, and, and sorry, also there's like a, a fall bloom in the diatoms as well. And then nanophytoplankton are fairly consistent over time in terms of their proportional contribution to the community. And then something that I found really interesting, like compared to other parts of the world, is this high contribution of picophytoplankton in the winter time and then in the in the summer period as well. So you see that in the Jul July, August period, there's a lot of peak of phytoplankton. And if you look down to the third plot, you can see the uh, one of the important uh, metrics that we use is the um, DHA to EPA ratio. And um, that is uh, in purple. And you can see that there's this um, um, peak value that's associated with that peak of phytoplankton bloom. Um, in July, August. And so the, generally it's, it's accepted that the higher the DHA EPA ratio, the better quality um, the food is for um, the zooplankton. And so like those, the, so those fatty acid measurements are just coming from particular organic matter samples just collected on a GFF filter. Um, so it could combine, you know, um, obviously microzooplankton, detritus, other, other parts of the food web as well. So that was really interesting to us. Um, and then, so like the, the key points here, like the phytoplankton size structure uh, matters to zooplankton and this changes seasonally. Um, we think that diatoms are not accessible to, as prey items to a lot of zooplankton, especially the smaller zooplankton copepods. They're feeding mostly on nano uh, phytoplankton, perhaps, and, and microzooplankton, some component of picoplankton. Um, 
The phytoplankton composition affects nutrients available to zooplankton. So you can see that in the, in the middle plot. Um, and the thing that was so interesting about this was that um, this peak in the uh, DHA EPA ratios in the, in the summertime, and, and we think this is because um, 18 carbon foofers that are very abundant in picophytoplankton um, can be converted to DHA and EPA microzooplankton. So actually turning those picophytoplankton into a very uh, nutritional food base for the zooplankton. So yeah, the picophytoplankton can support a varied and nutritious, nutritious prey field. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so we can, we've, we've tried to map out uh, some aspects of like food quality and, and food composition relevant to zooplankton. And then we've tried to trace that into the zooplankton as well. So using both fatty acids and uh, stable isotopes. And so this plot here, um, I'm just showing you that the top, the top figure is percentage EPA and the bottom figure is percentage uh, DHA. And you can see three, well, sorry, four, four size classes of, of of organism or, or matter. There's the particular organic matter in the sort of dark brown and then the pale brown is the small zooplankton size classes. So that, that's around the 250 micron to around, uh, I think it'd be, yeah, to a thousand microns. And then the median, which would be about 1000 to 2000 microns. And then the large zooplankton, which would be greater than 2000. Um, and the main takeaway here is that, um, well, the, the, the fatty acid profiles of the zooplankton really reflect the fatty acid profiles that we see in the in the water column and particularly the diatin dominated um, spring production so the diatins are they produce a, lot, a high percentage of epa so you see this really prevalence of epa in the body composition of the zooplankton during the, the springtime and then in the summertime this switches somewhat you get more flagellate comp, uh, contribution and that's uh, flagellates produce high amounts of DHA, and, and this contributes to high percentage DHA in the summertime, and that causes this uh, can cause a, a, a shift in the DHA to EPA ratio, so higher DHA EPA ratio in the in the zooplankton, which also means that there there would be more nutritious prey for for salmon in the summer period than there would be in the in the spring period. Um, next, please. Um, and then, so this, this figure is showing you um, just using fatty acid trophic markers, so essential fatty acids that we know are produced by, in, in high abundance by certain groups, and those groups are presented in the key underneath this figure. So we have cyanobacteria, green algae, flagellates, um, terrestrial material as well, diatoms, and then um, other PUFAs. And um, the sort of blank space in these figures is is just other fatty acids that are not that are not falling within these uh, categories. Um, so fatty acid markers show that diatoms and, and flagellates, which are the purple and pink, um, so the pink and the purple for diatoms and flagellates, they're really the dominant source of um, um, fatty acid to the zooplankton. Um, but as I showed in the previous figure, these can potentially also be sourced at the microzooplankton through this uh, conversion of 18 carbon, carbon PUFAs by microzooplankton um, and making that available to the zooplankton as well. Um, cyanobacteria, green algae, and terrestrial matter all contribute to the, uh, the different taxa. So like the, the, what you're seeing here is a, is a long list of zooplankton species. And yes, it's relevant. <laughs> we could unpack all of that. There's a lot of detail there in, in terms of what different groups do, but it's just, this is just to show really that um, the, the main contributions are from diatoms and, and flagellates. And then that these other groups, cyanobacteria, green algae, and terrestrial material also contribute, but it's, it's not a, a such a high percentage to the, the body fatty acid composition of zooplankton as the other two groups. Um, next, please. And so, um, yeah, so like we, we're interested in, in source materials to the zooplankton food web uh, or the plankton food web in general. And um, yeah, we, we see that the phytoplankton obviously are very important, but we're quite curious about the, the role of terrestrial material and how much of this is, is taken up by the, by the food web. And as a starting point here, the, um, this, this study really, mapped out the contribution of terrestrial material to particulate organic matter in the surface waters of the central coast region of British Columbia, where we had a really nice study system set up. Um, in the map here, you can see um, there's a, a suite of stations that um, from the, the right-hand side moving out of our, our new, um, if you look from the right, at the, at the right and the bottom, there's a fjord system, rivers inlet. So we had a series of stations down this fjord and then moving up into uh, uh, what's Fitzhugh Sound and then out into the, 
sort of outer coast area. So we have this nice gradient of sort of watershed types from like a glacial system um, uh, inputting to the coastal ocean to around um, the, the island there, Calvert Island, a lot of rain dominated systems uh, with a lot of uh, DOC flux um, through the winter time. So yeah, we, we had a look to see how uh, the terrestrial material up, uh, contribution to the POM varied spatially across this, uh, this sort of coastal offshore gradient and the watershed type gradient, and then also the, the seasonal aspect to that. And the, the figures are showing you the little, um, uh, the bar plots are showing you the uh, contributions of watershed in dark blue, marine phytoplankton in sort of medium blue, and the turquoise is marine macrophytes. So the percentage contribution of those three source materials to the particular organic matter for winter, spring, summer, and autumn across all of the stations. And so one thing that you will notice is that in the winter, winter time, there's a higher contribution of, uh, of terrestrial material. And that makes sense, particularly in that, um, that rain dominated system up around Calvert Island, where we have a lot of DOC flux. So it can be up to 50% of the organic matter. Um, and then um, if you look down on the fjord system, um, there's, a, there's a, a different seasonal cycle and that's because of the, the, uh, the summer runoff during the freshet. So there's a lot of DOC uh, material, um, a lot of material that's contributed to the system during the summertime, terrestrial material. Um, but uh, we don't have as much data in the winter time. But there is also a winter component to that, um, that production or terrestrial material contribution. So phytoplankton are not the only organic matter sources available to zooplankton and the terrestrial material input scale with proximity to watersheds. Um, and one of the things that I certainly found interesting was the high contribution of macrophyte um, particulate matter to the, to the POM, so up to 20%. I was not quite expecting that, but yeah, so that, that was pretty high. Um, next, please. So yeah, so like that's, you know, we, we've mapped out the, the, uh, these like POM contributions and we've looked at the phytoplankton community composition and uh, with respect to things relevant to zooplankton. And, and we're really trying now to, to understand how that material travels to the zooplankton, how important the different components are and what it means for uh, zooplankton health and nutritional quality for the things that are eating them, the herring and salmon, et cetera. Um, so we have further work to do with characterization of organic matter sources, so particularly from like urban environments, that's of interest. Um, and then understanding food web pathways, um, you know, we use a lot of fatty acids, but also stable isotopes. And if you use one, uh, if you use them on their own, they're potentially, uh, you're always left with questions, let's say. So like applying them together is a more powerful way to understand uh, food web uptake. Um, but uh, we also see the need for additional means. And so one of the things we are doing is looking at the DNA of zooplanks and stomach contents to better resolve their, their diets. Um, to get that taxonomic resolution that you just can't get out of isotopes and fatty acids um, most of the time. And then um, look at uh, resources as drivers of zooplankton food web structure. And um, so that means like the particulate or like the organic matter contributions to the system. So the, you know, uh, macrophyte, terrestrial, uh, different marine sources, uh, watershed, um, yeah, different type of watershed sources, how that really influences the lower trophic level dynamics, the food web pathways, productivity, and nutritional health of these animals. So we, we're quite interested in the near shore environments. And that's, I guess, one of the things that I see missing here um, in, in um, is, uh, well, just in the presentations that we've seen is like the, there's a focus on the bigger picture um, and, and perhaps some of the really interesting dynamics are right at the near shore interface where we we'd actually, we don't see, certainly in Canada, we don't do a great job at, at measuring that environment. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. My contact details are there and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Really appreciate that, that overview and, and teaser for folks to learn more. Um, we are going to take 10 minutes to do Q&A and we'll have some more time for Q&A at the end. Um, but Jan and a few others have to drop off at 1030. And so I want to make sure, particularly if anyone has questions for Jan, that we have an opportunity for that. And also just, you know, make a, a little bit more interactive piece to things. So um, we'll work through some of the questions in the chat. Feel free to drop more or you can um, raise your hand. Um, if you have things you would like to note, but I, I did want to highlight Jan's comment about the the ratio um, and how in the San Juan Archipelago with it's a, a negative slope, and so some of the the regional pieces there. 
Yeah, thanks, Marielle. I'll just kind of expound on that. Sophie and Christopher, I just was really fascinated by the the, the data. And um, I'd love to connect with you both um, to, to follow up on that in terms of, you know, what could be influencing those those slopes and why there's a difference. And I was just, it's just by chance that I have a student this year and she's been just focused um, on the silicate to nitrate ratio. And so it was just really ironic to hear. And Sophie, do you have any ideas why the slope difference? Well, I I had lots of ideas, but none of them have panned out. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've explored these data. They're from the Strait of Georgia in lots of different ways. So first of all, zero to 30 meters is um, mixing together the surface outflow layer and eutrophic zone and the, and the deeper water in the Strait of Georgia, because if, during freshet, the um the outflowing water is only seven meters deep right near the Fraser River and even the rest of the year and further away it's more like 30, 20 meters so you're, you're going down too deep really you're mixing two different things so I tried looking at just zero to five meters or only right at five meters and I'm still no matter and I've tried breaking them down by season and um no matter what I do I can't reproduce the slope that you get in Puget Sound Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really surprised that our slope was negative here in this. So it's San Juan Channel and then also the Strait of Juan de Fuca because we do get an influence of the Strait of Georgia in San Juan Channel. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry, you started to say more. No, but related to what you just said there, the difference between Puget Sound and Strait of Georgia is less in the southern Strait of Georgia than it is in the northern mm. Strait of Georgia. So there's maybe sort of a gradi gradient uh, gradient into Puget yeah. Sound. Yeah, fascinating. Well, anyways, I'd be happy to share our data and uh, um, follow up with you guys. Thanks. I'd love to talk more about that. Yeah, cool. Awesome. And Sophie, some other questions in the chat for you. Joel had asked about um, for additional sediment cores, if you have any initial reflections on kind of 10 locations or priority locations you'd like to see. I do. Before I answer that, I realized I never um, made a territorial acknowledgement when I started speaking, so I apologize for that. I'm speaking to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Wasanic people on the southeast coast of Vancouver Island, which is important, and I didn't mean to skip that. Um, so about the sediment cores, I think mainly if I were to do 10 more in the Salish Sea, I would concentrate on Puget Sound because we have a lot more cores in the Strait of Georgia and um, and more recent ones. And I've, but I, but it would be good to repeat the same stations that were already done just to see whether the trends that we've seen over time in those cores are continuing in the, the newer, uh, well, 20, 20 years later. And then also what's really useful in a sediment core is if you can find a place where the ratio of the surface mix layer depth to the sedimentation rate is low so that there is less mixing in the surface mix layer. It, um, you know, if you have a 10 centimeter mix layer and one, one centimeter per year of sedimentation, you're mixing together 10 years. If you've got a 10 centimeter mix layer and 0.1 centimeters per year, you're mixing together a hundred years. And so anywhere where we can get really, um, the, the tighter we can be on the temporal resolution, the better. So I did just have a new long core collected in the Strait of Georgia in a place where it seems like we can get about two or three year resolution. Um, and so if we can find any places like that in Puget Sound as well, those would be ideal. But unfortunately we won't really know until we've collected a core. So it'd probably be good to collect additional cores, sequentially collect a few more, see how they turn out and then choose more locations based on those. Wonderful, thank you for that. And again, folks can raise hands if they have questions. Otherwise, we'll work through those in the um, chat here. Um, Parker had a question earlier about the comparison um, to that 280 number and kind of the and what you were seeing there, Sophie. Any off the cuff reflections? And that's also yeah. okay to, to follow up offline too. Sure. Uh, yeah, I don't think that we can compare it quantitatively. We What we have seen in the Strait of Georgia based on the nitrogen budget is that about 96% of the fresh organic matter that's uh, marine derived organic matter at the surface is um, remineralized before it reaches the bottom. Only 4% reaches the bottom approximately over a 350 meter water column. 
And there are different, there are two, at least the, probably more, but there are two that I'm aware of, models of remineralization with depth, and they don't give exactly the same answer to each other. I think that if we started with what's happening in the bottom and extrapolated upwards, we'd be using the tail to wag the dog too much. But we, so it's, I think it's better to stick with using the sediment core trends over time relative to themselves in the, just to say over time, we see that there's been an increase or there's been a decrease. We could maybe even be quantitative about that and say a 25% increase, but it, I would be very hesitant to calculate what that meant for exactly the, the number at the surface, unless we just say, well, we see a four times increase down there. And now we know at the surface that it's 280, we're going to multiply by four, but I wouldn't want to calculate the exact number based on the exact number in the core. Great, thank you for those reflections. My Sira, I know you were chatting about this a little bit, but anything you wanna add in terms of the value of the data and the complexity of collecting data from fairies? Yeah, I think there was a question about that. And I was just saying that uh, it's not an easy, uh, it's an extremely rich data set, but not an easy, uh, system to implement and have it ongoing on ferries. At least it was not easy for me. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, work and uh, I could only, I just, I did that effectively because Ocean Networks Canada supported me on that and BC Ferries as well. And I had the resource from uh, the MIOPAR program in Canada uh, and the Canadian Space Agents to, to buy and install those sensors. So it was very effective, but unfortunately it was working very well. But uh, in 2020, uh, because of uh, COVID restrictions of going to the ferries, uh, the, pro the project was, uh, I don't know if it's going to get back, but we had to stop the program because it does need it needs maintenance and we had to go in the ferries, uh, especially in the springtime uh, on a biweekly basis uh, to, to make sure that the systems were working fine. There was no, uh, uh, nothing dirty on the lands to make sure the data was good. And it's a lot of data to, to use and process at the end of the day, you know, it's continuous data acquisition. So it was tremendous and it was very useful for uh, understanding the calibration of Sentinel 3A and 3B and uh, as I think I mentioned in the chat, would be extremely useful for uh, the PACE mission, right? Uh, so if uh, we manage to get it back in the ferries by the 2024, uh, it will be tremendous for, for vicarious calibration of PACE and also for, again, dealing with the atmospheric correction model for this region, which is one of the most important parts on uh, good satellite data, right? Beyond the, the model, model development for products, but uh, it does give you very good data at the end. Wonderful. Thank you for, for speaking to that. We'll do one more question and then we'll have again additional questions at the end. Um, and so feel free to continue to drop those in. Um, I'm going to keep this open to any of the, the presenters who want to reflect on it, which is the question from Bart about whether there's an understanding of the contribution of macrophytes in the near shore environments to the total biomass of primary producers relative to total primary production or total primary production in Puget Sound. And um, Mariel, I was just wondering if we had anybody on from DNR that we had a conversation about this with last week. Is anybody on from then? Otherwise, I could just recap what, what that conversation was about. Um, so, so, yeah, well, from, from the conversation we had there, um, folks were saying that the, the empirical data that's available now, um, particularly for macrophytes and, and submerged aquatic vegetation, is exactly. improving. Bart, can yeah. I let me give Bart uh, permission and they can... Ah, there we go. Thank you. I couldn't see who the question was from. So yeah, but that would be great. Thank you. Give me just a sec. Okay, Bart, you should be enabled now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I was just wondering about that because um, we are getting better data on um, area covered by seagrass and different groups of algae in the nearshore, and especially in the central basin of Puget Sound. 
and I was wondering if um, you know there there has anybody ever done like a comparison of um, how much biomass is in you know represented in phytoplankton, for example, relative to uh, biomass in near shore environments, and what's that contribution? Because um, I'm just wondering if also in Puget Sound there could be significant contribution to primary production in the system. Any of our speakers have initial reflections? Otherwise, I also know we have quite a few folks on the monitoring side in the in the audience. So um, feel free to raise your hand if you have any reflections on that. Otherwise, we can kind of continue that as a conversation and follow up on the workshop too. Okay, Bart, I'm going to say that, that it, the lack of answer means it's an important question for us to address. So I very much uh, appreciate you bringing it into the conversation. Um, with that, I'm going to transition us into this next section, which looks more at the, the modeling side of things. Um, Stefano is going to kick us off here and then hand it over to, to Ben Roberts. Um, but continue to drop chat in. We'll have some Q&A time again at the very end um, for kind of everybody holistically. But with that, I'll hand it to you, Stefano. Uh, thank you, Muriel. Um, so, uh, yeah, as we've seen from today's presentation and, and all of the uh, PCM phytoplankton vital sign workshops, the focus on advancing uh, our understanding of phytoplankton dynamics um, is very much around the improvement on monitoring data and how that can be integrated in the various modeling and, and analysis endeavors discussed. So here I'll briefly discuss um, and present uh, some of the representation of phytoplankton in the Salish Sea model and the analysis um, that's been done there on dynamics relevant to changing nutrient loading specifically. Um, Given the relative confidence that we have in the physical processes that are modeled uh, with hydrodynamic models, um, such as the Salish Sea model um, and live ocean, there's an opportunity to address the scientific questions posed. Um, and some of these were based on, or this here written up here is, is based on uh, the hypotheses that Sophia's identified earlier that have been identified by the state's monitoring data. So it's really around uh, how to, the core of it is really around a better quantification of the physical controls and nutrients availability uh, to phytoplankton and other biota, uh, particularly in sub-basins and in inlets that have been identified um, with low DO impacts uh, from nutrients. Nutrient budgets are a key tool here to this investigation, and I'll cover a couple of components that are available now with the model ones um, that have been done by the state and others. And follow, um, following that, we have Ben Roberts, who can focus on um, exchange flow component, which is a, a key challenge in these budget calculations everywhere. Next, please. So I uh, just pulled this slide from what we sent in some of the pre-read materials that I'd refer you all to. And this includes the validation sensitivity analysis and the relevant uh, uh, publication reports that have been done, and in particular, uh, the sensitivity analysis work that's been done on the state of um, by the state on phytoplankton parameters, and that's the AMED uh, 2019 link here. Um, I do want to signpost uh, two aspects of the, the model versions. Um, and the first is that the applied model, and that's the one that's used by the Nutrient Reduction Project, um, does represent phytoplankton in its role in biogeochemical cycling and include some exchange with the sediment exchange. And then second, that the key updates in the later uh, research model um, specifically go from a change in uh, grazing uh, uh, from a constant predation term to one that is a simulation of zooplankton explicitly, um, heterogeneity and turbidity, and then um, also uh, explicitly showing um, uh, submerged aquatic uh, vegetation. Uh, next slide, Paul. 
Yeah, so using the model out that's been applied in the nutrient reduction project, um, we've extracted some of the results for the phytoplankton uh, dynamics to share. And this is looking at three inlets, Bellingham, Sinclair, and Case um, in the sound here on the, on the red on the right. And this extends the data set and the validation of sediment uh, model um, and sediment diagenesis that was at the uh, sediment exchange workshop prior. Next slide, please. So Rachel Mueller, who is our colleague who's in, in the audience here, has um, mainly shared her initial results on this. And we do look forward to your thoughts on how um, reasonable these look and how we can improve this analysis going forward and its use. Um, so please reach out to her and I. Um, the plots shown here are the modeled current conditions for 2014 uh, for each of those inlets, uh, the colored lines. Um, and these are calculated from the median net primary production values uh, for the water column across each of the cells um, in each of these abatements shown on the left here, with a running 24 hour average applied to the hourly output. The gray line that you can see behind each is the model reference condition from the nutrient reduction project, which is all of the human uh, nutrient loadings um, removed in that scenario. So what we can see at this point is that the trends in magnitude are relatively similar for current conditions. Our lines across uh, all of these inlets um, with all the peaks less than four grams per meter square per day. Um, they all have a, a growth season from March to October with the, the early spring boom and, and late autumn. Um, and when we looked at the preliminary data on the hourly, it does show a great range of daily daily values as would be expected. Um, what's interesting here is that at this point we're not seeing very much of a shift in response of net primary production with the removal of all of the anthropogenic sources, which would require a little further work to confirm and, and to understand um, if the model is behaving as expected uh, here. Next slide, please. Um, purpose of putting this slide up is just to show the types of relevant data that can be pulled out now uh, for folks that are interested, and that's for any inlet data um, on any of these locations on the right, uh, where you're seeing uh, low DO uh, identified by the state, and that's the, the inlets with them, the pink cells. Um, the important part here is that um, on the left, we can show a representation of the dianoflagellates and diatoms throughout the water column on the x-axis from layer one at the surface to 10 at the bottom through 2014. And below that, um, dissolved oxygen and some of the other nutrient and, and um, physical parameters that are important to primary production. And those first two then give us what is uh, outputted also um, at every time step in every scenario that's been done um, so far by the state and by um, of those using the, the applied version of the model. Um, it's based on also the basis of the net primary production that we've been talking about. Um, so our, these results are comparable um, with prior measured to model data, uh, which is very limited when we're talking about net or gross primary production. Um, and this slide here, I've got further information on what has been done there, which is sent out in um, a pre-read. On the right, uh, we have the entire time series for the combined data set from 2019 to 2001. And that's from the data that Jan Newton was talking about expanding on um, with Dan uh, Voorhees. And this shows a wide temporal variability within each of these sites that, that were covered over those three years. Um, the colored dots are for each of the three sites and the comparative model outputs are shown with lines of the same color. Um, and in each case, uh, it was identified that it's, a, it's roughly double uh, the measured data, the, the point data they're showing over to the, um, to the model data at those locations. Um, the net primary production uh, data that we were looking at in inlets is similar in magnitude if you were to overlay it um, to say the gross primary production there for possession sound in orange. Um, and that's recognizing the differences between those two measures. Um, in 
there were there are some historical data at different locations that doesn't have such a, a long time period, uh, which emphasizes the importance of getting to some of the data that Jan's pointed out. Um, the prime uh, prior historical studies have shown a range of spring peaks of around 4.8 to 10 milligrams um, for quite a long time period. Next slide, please. Moving to some of the recent results from the research model uh, that Terang's group has done. There's a few key plots that are worth showing as they have a clear correlation between river flow uh, exchange flow interannually, as well as a change in the phytoplankton zooplankton dynamics. So during the heat wave years where the model was run from 2014 to 17, exchange flow increased in response to river flow, and that's uh, the top top there for river flow and, and the bottom for exchange. Um, next slide. Um, increasing uh, nutrients in the system and the availability of the eubotic zone occurred from that, and that led to an increase in primary productivity uh, that was seen in measured data and subsequent uh, zoo mass bio, bioplankton, sorry, excuse me, zoo mass biomass and zooplankton grazing of, of um, phytoplankton. Next slide, please. So nutrient budgeting tools can help us drill a little further uh, into our understanding of these processes that were presented in Terrain's 2021 paper there and to look at what's relevant in places where DO has been identified as impacted, uh, such as inlets, and, and what that might mean in terms of the impacts on the biota there. Um, Sophia put up the Sutton budget um, for the Strait of Georgia, which I put here again, and it's a really good template example to discuss what might be needed if we want to look at, say, the South Sound uh, or an inlet such as Case. Um, next slide, please. Uh, sediment losses and remineralization um, at the, the bottom there are relatively straightforward to get out of the Salish Sea model um, into this kind of budget. And that was discussed at the prior workshop and we'll leave that uh, link to the sediment exchange workshop at the bottom. Uh, net primary production, um, as we've looked at, is calculated in every run and the state of the state's application of the model. It's a little bit more tricky to get at the gross primary production and respiration, and it may require a rerunning of the model. Um, but this is routinely being set up to be an output um, for other versions of uh, ICM, which is which is part of the FBCOM ICM Salish Sea model, um, for example, in Chesapeake Bay. So this really leaves exchange flow which is one of the biggest challenges whenever we're looking at calculating a nutrient budget. Um, towards this, Terang's group has applied direct tidally average uh, calculations of mass flux. Um, and he will present some of that at the following workshop and is here on this call to, to answer any questions there. And uh, Ben, following now, will talk a little bit further on the method that he's been exploring um, that looks at uh, indirect salinity-based um, mass balance flux. And the idea there is that it can be uh, applied to all of the existing runs. So with that, I will hand to Ben. And that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm excited to introduce Ben Roberts. He's a researcher with Mike Brett at the engineering department at UW where he's doing his PhD. Ben, you wanna take it from here? Sure, thanks, Marielle. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about um, how we can use Salish Sea model outputs to quantify estuarine exchange flow. So you can go to the next slide. I'm gonna to try to breeze through this to leave time for questions. Um, but generally, I'm losing the same figure that uh, Stefano just left us off with uh, from Sutton 2013. Uh, being able to quantify those advective fluxes in and out of any control volume that we set up is going to be quite important for being able to analyze um, any kind of flows based on understanding various water constituents like dissolved oxygen or nutrients. And I would like to do use this for my own research to be able to measure how things are changing within the model, either in a large basin or just a small inlet. I'm an example of this on the next slide at a conceptual level. Uh, so this is just looking at some 
pieces of model output I've run from a couple different scenarios. What they are doesn't matter. What we're looking at is a heat map of duration of hypoxia at the bottom layer of the model in Dabab Bay. And for a more complex uh, change to the model parameters, this particular one was changing some freshwater discharges. Uh, the follow-up question is, okay, so I got different results, but why are they different? So if we think of Dabab Bay as just a simple control volume like box, uh, if you go next, uh, one possibility is that we're seeing changes in bottom DO because of physical advection. We may see, for instance, uh, low dissolved oxygen water coming in from the Pacific Ocean and getting into Hood Canal and into Dabab Bay and causing DO to lower just from a purely physical process. The second possibility, if you go to the next, is that we could have a change in the internal biogeochemical processes. So if we can split these up, we can quantify them and then understand what the differences are. This also applies to any sort of like, you know, interannual variability of the system, where if I change the entire model year over, I'm definitely going to see changes like this, but there's so many things that changed, it can be hard to figure out what, what is it about the different year that made the model different. So next. So uh, the method that I'm trying to use to extract this is called the total exchange flow method. Uh, Parker McCready is well known for having developed this. Um, this is a figure from his 2011 paper showing the theory of how it works. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we are able to quantify the flow across a section that we draw in the mo across the model cells and look at it, the transport across that section as a function of the salinity at those boundary values. And that allows us to basically use salt as a way of tagging the water to tell where it's going across that section over time. So it helps with the tidal averaging, essentially. And another reason we might want to care about this is uh, this is also what uh, Parker is using in live ocean to measure exchange flows within the same system. So if we care about comparing the Salish Sea model output to other models, it would be great to be able to use the same metrics so that for a physical oceanographer, they can say, okay, this is, we have the same physical transport characteristics in both models, or maybe they're different. So next. So this can also be extended to use for uh, non-conservative tracers. So the basic method is talking about the transport of salt, Q in and Q out, but it can also be used for other constituents. The only difference is if it's not conservative, when you perform the mass balance of everything within the control volume, it's going to be equal to the advective changes in and out. There could be a freshwater input from the rivers within that control volume. And then whatever's left over, assuming that we don't have any errors in our calculations, that's the total sources and sinks for that particular parameter, which could be DIN, just like Sutton did, or it could be dissolved oxygen or something else. And for the cases of something like dissolved oxygen, where we also have um, certain fluxes coming in from the atmosphere, from the sediment, those are things that we can also use model outputs to quantify and then further refine what those other sinks are, aside from the ones that we can easily quantify from just the model outputs. And the advantage of this, by the way, is that ideally we shouldn't have to rerun the model to be able to get this data out of the results that we already have. So next. So this is a uh, figure from Parker's paper from 2021, looking at estuarine exchange and resonance times within Puget Sound based on live ocean. There's a model based on ROMs. So my interest is in using all of the code that's been already published for doing these quantifications so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. But there are a few differences between ROMs and FECOM in terms of how they structure their grids. So the way these control volumes are all laid out, you can see the horizontal and vertical lines on that figure. Those are the locations of the sections where the exchange is being computed. And they're all north, south, and east, west because ROMs is an XY grid, it makes sense to just draw horizontal and vertical lines. And the velocities are just going to be the U or the V component. And it's rather simple how you can compute those transports across the sections. So next. 
And this is also showing a picture from what Parker presented at a previous workshop, um, looking at how you can extend this to do a budget of Puget Sound using dissolved inorganic nitrogen. The green line there on that upper plot is looking at what that total source sink term is for DIN after you subtracted off everything else that's been transported in and out, uh, then you can tell what's actually changed inside of a particular control volume. So next. So this is what's look, this looks at uh, some of my own outputs here uh, from doing the extraction of FVCOM outputs. FVCOM has an unstructured triangular grid and so you have to do kind of a jagged section across the model. Uh, this is looking at a particular one in Hood Canal. And you're going to have transports across each of those small line segments. And what you can then do is just see what you're seeing on the left is just what the mean velocities and the mean salinities are across the section for a particular month. So next. And this is looking at um, what the results should ultimately look like. Um, I had to fiddle with this a little bit to get it right and make sure that uh, we have monotonic functions for the flow in out across the section because we shouldn't see large uh, oscillations as you go along a thalweg within Hood Canal. And so this looks good, but right now I'm still working on the process because if you pick small, ch if you change the section location slightly, it no longer looks monotonic. And that's a problem I'm trying to work out. So next, and this is looking at a basic volume budget to show how what we want to see is very small amounts of error once you subtract off everything from doing a basic mass balance. Uh, one problem that I ran into here is that in order to get this to work at this small time interval, notice I'm only looking at a period of about two days, is in order to get it right within the tide signal. I had to actually rerun my hydrogenic model with a half hour output so that I could get a good interpretation interpolation to get DVDT. Um, that's kind of annoying, but I'm hopeful that once we apply a tidal average to the data, that that won't be an issue. And then once I get this right, ideally, I can just perform the calculations with existing Python scripts that Parker has produced. And then we have the results. So that's basically what I wanted to talk about, and uh, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, we'll open up for questions. Folks can raise hands. Um, I also realized I forgot to mention that we do have several folks from Department of Ecology listening in on the workshop for information sharing and context. Um, they're not at liberty to, to answer questions or ask questions at this moment, um, but are very much following along in terms of, of sharing information there. I was going to say, Mike Connor, I know you had several questions, so I thought I, I'd go ahead and let you unmute. Um, if you want to ask one or two in the last couple of minutes here. The um, satellite data that uh, Dr. Costa presented were just so compelling. Um, and the question is essentially how hard it would be to uh, make the ferry system work in uh, the Southern Sound, I can imagine a ferry from Kingston to Seattle would be a great location and just how much of a difference, how much data you'd need, how hard it would be to set up, it would seem like a, a fairly crucial play to uh, extend her, her work uh, to prioritize it down in the Southern Sound. The value of it just looks astonishing. So um, wanted to We've had some discussion about it. It seems like an obvious thing for either UW or DOE to do. Wonderful. Appreciate you highlighting that opportunity there. Looking a question for, other... for me or a comment, or should I just stay quiet? I don't know. What if you have reflections, go for it, my Sierra. I think in many ways um, this was a, sh a shout out. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I do agree. And, uh, um, um, and there are many different uh, systems, not many, a few other systems available that maybe would be slightly easier. And uh, But I think the first step on that is not really uh, necessarily investing on a full installation of radiometers in the ferry. 
maybe that would be something really important for the PACE mission, which hopefully, because it's a NASA American mission, you guys would be more fully integrated on that. And with actually, there are many funds available to uh, organizing this kind of uh, infrastructure as part of the PACE mission that Americans can, can dig in. I can't, for example, but Americans can. Uh, but maybe a first approach is not even doing all of that in a short term could be looking at what we're producing for this the, the area now with the models that we develop based on the Strait of Georgia uh, waters and uh, you know other waters north of BC and see if the, these products that we're generating are actually uh, accurate enough for the Puget Sound waters. Right. So it's not that you need to go back to the reflectance, but I think the first step for you, because we already did a lot of analysis on that, is looking at the product themselves and see, OK, do they reflect what we expect? And this can be done based on in situ data, based on the literature, like a more qualitative and a, or a more quantitative analysis, looking at the trends that the products are showing and see, does it fit what you expect for the area? or putting together this robust in situ database, which I'm sure you have a lot and say, okay, let's do what we call match up analysis and see how well it reflects the Puget Sound waters, the products that are being generated. So that would be my kind of uh, uh, recommendations, a first step. And, and maybe uh, later on, uh, if it's something that would be very valuable, um, uh, invest on an infrastructure to 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 start to uh, participate in the pace mission uh, in a in a in a consistent way and generating product that would be really in tune with uh, with the Puget Sound waters. Great, thank you for those reflections, my Sarah. Um, Seth Brooke, I gave you also the ability to to chime in. I thought you had some great comments and reflections there in the chat. Seth, are you able to unmute now? Yes, this is Seth okay. Book. Um, I work for the Skokomish tribe um, in the Hood Canal. So some of these um, very site-specific um, issues um, is very interesting. Um, you know, we have the eutrophication, we have stratification. We did some research on coccolithophores and, and some spectral radiometry work to have these continuous data especially with satellite stuff. The MODIS stuff is just not good enough with the 4K kilometer resolution. Maybe the one kilometer resolution will be good enough for a kind of a narrow canal, but um, with increased technologies, um, I'm very interested in um, seeing what you all, very smart, very um, highly technologically advanced uh, folks um, can, can offer the tribes to be able to look at some of these really site specific, really rabbit hole sorts of issues. But I appreciate it. Thank you very much. If I can comment on that, Seth. Um, yeah, so thank you for your comment. And because as you said, you're looking at narrow canals. So what I would recommend is you look at the this uh, European satellite and it's freely, you know, we generate these products freely and the, the, the data from the satellite is freely as well. So you don't pay for any of that, right? And it's 300 meters spatial resolution, right? So it would really, it's like for our data set, now is the first time that we can actually address the inlets, like dynamics of inlets, we would never able address, be able to address that with MODIS, which is one kilometer spatial resolution. And I think the difference as well is sometimes, for example, when NASA produce a product and it put available through the NASA web page, that product was generated with a model that are considered what we, what we call global waters. They're not tuned for the uh, the type of waters in this region per se. So if you are lucky, they may work for the region, but generally speaking, they are not tuned for these waters. And we have shown this for MODIS, for Sentinel, for all of them. So at the end of the day, for example, the product that we're generating are tuned for these types of water. So it does require a little bit more work, but you have a product now that better reflects what's happening in the water. So download satellite products from 
the NASA webpage, the European webpage, from the whatever webpage, it's not always the best approach because they are not built with models that consider the type of water that we have here. So it's always important to keep this in mind. Wonderful. And I know we're a few minutes over. Um, I see Brandon, you've got your hand raised. So uh, for those who are able to stay on, um, we'll end with Brandon as final comment. For any questions we haven't gotten to, we will follow up as always offline. Um, and did want to just highlight in the chat that we dropped in the link for our watershed modeling workshop next week, but also Department of Ecology. Um, we'll be talking about sparrow and nutrients tomorrow. Um, so some more information in the chat there. Brandon. Great. Yeah, thanks, Mariela. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted a just a quick uh, update on the state's ferries program. You know, we are in the process of reinstalling sensors um, in a flow through system on the Victoria Clipper. So that system, you know, was very useful and powerful for a, a number of years, and it went offline during COVID when the the ship was being sold, but we are actively in the process of resurrecting that system and installing a thermal salinograph. You know, that'll be kind of the, the first instrument payload, but we're designing it in a, such a way that it should be easier for other researchers in the region to come in and install their sensors, you know, and and kind of use it as a, as a general platform. Um, and also just, you know, a, a quick uh, shout out on the satellite side, you know, like May Sarah said, there's a lot of really good high resolution sensors. Um, you know, I think there's value also in some of the terrestrial platforms, things like Landsat and Sentinel-2, um, which get the spatial resolution down to 10 to 30 meters. So for some of our smaller bays and inlets where we have a lot of, you know, strong optical gradients, I think there's some value in looking at those data. Um, and we've done a little bit of that in the past, um, but like May Sarah said, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of making sure that the products that come out of that uh, are validated and reflect the, the sort of water quality we have around here. But um, those are a couple of things that I think are worth pursuing as we go forward. Great, well, thank you all as always for the robust discussion, the, the thoughtful questions, the excitement about collaborations. I see a lot of um, connections and discussions that are going to continue after this from the chat. Um, in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to Stefano or myself with any questions um, or follow-up, and we will get the materials posted to the website in the next couple of days. Um, and again, appreciate all of you. Thank you.